Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Mitzi Soretto, Dean Job, and Pris Priscilla Scott Rhodes to discuss the best new crime stories, Crimes of Passion, Obsession, and Revenge, published by our friends at Mango Publishing Group. Mitzi Soretto is an author and anthology editor whose books encompass multiple genres, including those from her popular true crime franchise, The Best New True Crime Stories. Her novels, anthologies, and short stories have been translated into multiple languages. She has the added distinction of being the editor of the first anthology of erotic fiction to include a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Mitzi has appeared internationally on radio and television and at major literature festivals and has taught creative writing around the world, including several universities in the UK. The fifth volume in her true crime series, The Best New True Crime Stories, Partners in Crime, will be published in 2022. Tonight, we are also joined by Dean Job, who is the author of The Case of the Murderous Dr. Cream, which recreates the crimes of Canadian doctor Thomas Neal Cream a Victorian era serial killer who murdered as many as 10 people in the United States, Canada, and Britain. Dean writes the monthly true crime column, Stranger Than Fiction for Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, and his features and book reviews have appeared in many publications, a few being Crime Reads, The Irish Times, and The Washington Independent Review of Books. He teaches in the Master of, the, of Fine Arts in the Creative Nonfiction Program at the University of King's College in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Finally, we are also joined by Priscilla Scott Rhodes, who is the author of four novels under the pseudonym Pascal Scott. For many years, she wrote for LGBT and alternative newspapers in San Francisco, among them The Centennial and the San Francisco Bay Guardian. Her articles, short stories, poetry, and erotica have appeared in numerous publications and anthologies, including The Best New True Crime Stories, Crimes of Passion, Obsession, and Revenge. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And you can order your copy of the best new crime stories from Books and Books below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hi, everyone. We're, we're all here, I think. <laughs> hi, Dean, and hi, Priscilla. I'm so glad you were able to come on with this uh, for, for this evening, if it's evening for you. Um, I'm Mitzi Soretto, and I'm here to uh, chat about uh, Hot Off the Press, the best new true crime stories, crimes of passion, obsession, and revenge. And I shall flash the book. Nice noir cover here. Uh, I'm really excited. I've, I've been chatting with these two authors here, oh, you know, through the whole process of getting these books done. So this is the first time we're sort of meeting face to face here at Books and Books. Uh, I'm just going to kind of um, give a brief introduction about uh, the series and, and uh, my how I put these books together. Um, this is actually book number four. Uh, just to give you a brief rundown. Uh, the first book was the Serial Killers volume. Uh, the second uh, book was the Small Towns volume. The third book was Wall-Mannered Crooks, Rogues, and Criminals. And here we are at book four, uh, which just came out on August 10th for most of the world uh, in print and ebook and audio. Uh, so I actually don't have a hardcore true crime background. Uh, uh, you know, that's that might be unusual for, for someone who's working in true crime. Um, I, I'm more of a fiction writer, although I have dealt in nonfiction before. Uh, and uh, it just sort of came about uh, in a in an impromptu discussion with a, a publisher to put together, a, start working on some true crime. Uh, and since I didn't have any pre preconceived notions about what I wanted to do, um, I'm kind of one of those people that I just kind of do what I want and, and I don't pay attention to what others are doing. And I, I guess it's working since we're in book four and I'm contracted up through book seven. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I have more ideas, so stay tuned for that. Um, 
what I like to do when I do these books, I try to reach out as widely as possible uh, to really get in an interesting cast of writers. I mean, I feel in a way that I'm I'm casting a film. That, that is how I how it seems to me. Um, I look for a really a, a interesting variety of writers um, who are writing material from you know in their own voices, and that's sort of what makes this book unique is that we have so many different writers in the book you know 14 15 stories i think i've gone as high as 16 in the past um people from all over the world writing about uh cases from all over the world uh different time periods uh different locations so you get a real variety a real mix and as i said the voices you're hearing from many different voices many different storytelling techniques and i don't really think anyone else has done that and um i'm really excited that the books are being really well received and and people seem to really be enjoying the material and um sort of learning something new being fascinated by things they didn't know about and even if it is something they heard about you know for, if it's a very famous crime case they get something new from reading these stories so i'm i'm really proud of that um I take only new material, so everybody is basically writing something just for this anthology. Um, these are not reprints. Uh, these are not something you've read, you know, seen somewhere else. Uh, they are written specifically for the books, so they are called new crime, new true crime stories for a reason. Uh, I think one of the most important things to me is to have a very international perspective in this series. Um, I've had comments made to me that. Um, some people were surprised at how international the books are. Um, I think perhaps more so even with American readers, they sort of assume everything is going to be set in the United States. And true crime is all over the world. Crime is everywhere. I, I don't think there's probably any country that can say they're immune to that. And I'd like to really represent um, many cultures and many countries. And, and that's what I look for when I put my books together. And that's kind of my philosophy and it always has been. Um, I've done anthologies in the past, but the true crime, as I said, is is relatively uh, newer for me. Um, the first book came out, um, gosh, maybe a year and a half ago, two years. It might be two years now, I've, I've lost track. <laughs> but um, I actually, the, the, the interesting thing is um, I did a journalism undergraduate degree and it seems as if since I started to get into true crime, all those things that I learned in journalism school, I've put back into practice. So I suppose that wasn't, it wasn't totally wasted, right? Yeah. Um, so um, I will start uh, throwing out a question to our, our two contributors here, Dean and Priscilla. Um, since Dean's on my left, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this to you first. Um, what, okay. do, what do you think makes true crime so fascinating to readers? Well, I, um... Um, you mentioned journalism. I mean, my background is in journalism as well. Mm. And uh, that means you have to be a storyteller. You have to hook a reader with uh, an interesting lead in, uh, lead paragraphs. And um, I think true crime is just such a riveting, dramatic way of presenting stories, be they historical or contemporary. Uh, I mean, there's just so much inherent interest and and uh, importance and drama in, in true crime. And there's a lot at stake. Uh, the, if it's a murder case, there's been a horrendous wrong done to an individual. It's an offense against society. And the offender could easily be looking at a death sentence. So the stakes are incredibly high. And um, the situations are often fascinating. Uh, and um, I really like historical true crime going back in time and I find true crime just a wonderful way to introduce readers to the past, to explain the, the context that a crime has happened in, uh, so they can understand the uh, um, the other factors at play, be they the, the state of policing, which might have led an offender to, uh, to escape justice, to just uh, uh, the mores and, and attitudes of society that may have contributed to the crime. Mm. Okay, uh, Priscilla, same question. What what fascinates you, or what do you think makes true crime fascinating to people? Yeah, and I think it's interesting. I have a journalism background, so <laughs> I think that. But I'm I'm 
one of those people who believes that journalism is where you should start as a writer. Um, so I studied it, and I and I was going to say, Dean, you can tell you're a teacher, and I bet you're a good teacher. <laughs> Um, what makes it fascinating? The themes are universal. There is high drama. The stakes cannot be higher as in the case of murder or uh, atrocious crimes. Uh, and there's a chance to uh, remedy, to right a wrong. And for readers, there's a catharsis. Um, even, even when the offender is not caught, you somehow feel, uh, as in one of your recent uh, anthology uh, about uh, offenders who got away with the crime, um, the reader still has a sense of completion and of uh, justice, if only that there are good people trying to solve uh, what's happened. Uh, so, so I think that um, it, it, there's an element of escapism in reading crime, but I, I think it goes more to universal themes and the need to to right wrongs when so often in life it seems that they don't get righted. Yeah, yeah, I, I have to say that's true. I, from from what I've been, uh, you know, when you, a lot of people are writing about um, why is true crime so popular, and that comes into into play about that sense of um, completion. Mm -hmm. You know, you you've got all this information laid out, and then there is a conclusion, and and hopefully the conclusion is that the culprit has been caught and and punished for the crime. Yeah, but as we know, that doesn't always happen. But. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what, what's funny is, is um, for me with with true crime, I, I, I mentioned earlier that I, I didn't really um, look at what other people were doing and I wasn't really a true crime reader. But when I started to get into it, it occurred to me that I actually have been consuming true crime from an early age because I watched all those um, those shows on television, those sort of news magazine shows that and pretty much, yeah, they always cover true yeah. crime cases. So yeah. it's like, well, I've, I've been absorbing this. It's just not in the written word. I was watching it visually, but... Mm -hmm. And then hooked me from an early age as well, and I can't even explain why. But <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, as far as um, so each each of you know, I, each of you are are very different writers and have and approach your subjects in a different way. Um, Dean, what is what do you consider your individual approach to writing true crime? Well, I, as much as possible, I guess the journalist in me wants to know everything, which of course is impossible. But I think I just, I think it's important to just research as much as you can. And I always assume that records may still exist even a hundred years or more later. And I often find they do. Original files are sometimes sitting in the original courthouse where the trial took place <laughs> in the 19th century. I've had that happen. And, um, to find out as much as possible, but also about the times, the place, the people, the characters, so you can very, make it as vivid as possible, so you can write in scenes and recreate scenes. Again, faithful to the to the uh, to the factual record, uh, not not embellishing at all, but amassing enough information that you can hopefully make the past come alive and the people in it come alive and uh, and really uh, hook the reader and, and immerse them in uh, in that lost world. Yeah, yeah I, I, yeah, I agree with what you're saying as well because these are actual people mm -hmm. and, and we must always be aware of the fact that um, these people did exist, these are not fictional, fictional characters and you know, I, I think we have a lot of responsibility on how we portray these these individuals. Uh, Priscilla, same question. What is your approach? Yeah, and uh, actually, I this is new for me, writing true crime. So it's um, the two anthologies that I've been published in with you are my only true crime stories. Um, and uh, prior to this, um, I've done uh, fiction and uh, then I have a journalism background and I did mostly um, soft soft news, features, guides, best of the city, that sort of thing. So I never had a crime beat. And what I was interested in when I saw your call for submissions was that you uh, said you preferred 
a personal angle, if there was some connection to the story. And I thought that was a challenge. And so then I thought about uh, what crimes have somehow played a part in my life. And I came up with two. And then one of them is uh, the George Bosk story, uh, which is in this anthology. And that uh, I had actually been interested in and was doing research uh, before the call for submission. Um, and I did uh, quite a bit of research, as, you, as Dean says, you can, you can really find things once you start looking. And I went through the Freedom of Information Act uh, and got the, his files from the FBI. But they, they told me when I applied, they said it may take up to seven years. Um, and I said, okay, and they came five years later, and so um, I was still interested in the story, and then eventually, so, so that story goes back about a decade. Um, but So this is a relatively new uh, experience for me, and as a writer, I keep trying new, or I have tried new things over the years and the decades, so that's been my approach. Oh, that, that's funny about it. it took that long. It, it, it's a good thing you didn't request these files right, right when my submission call came out because you'd certainly have missed the deadline on that. Yeah. <laughs> like by five yeah, well, or seven years. Well, I think if you're, if you have a pre, if you're a part of the, the mainstream press, I think they expedite it. But if you're just, a, I said, I'm just a freelancer and they said it'll be up to seven years. I think they were trying to discourage me. <laughs> I said, that's fine, I'll just wait. And they, and they yeah, I, they, yeah that's very discouraging. That's very <laughs> discouraging. You know, you mentioned about the research too and, and, and uh, the, 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 that, that term about falling into the rabbit hole is something that definitely happens in this in true crime i mean i find that the more i dig the more i keep finding and and then of course you have to cross check everything a million times over yeah. because even something in a in a uh, so-called legitimate publication you know it could be say in the new york times just a random choice but i mean there might be an inaccuracy yeah. I mean, inaccuracies and then they get they keep rolling along and they keep showing up in other places and it's just it's a real it's really difficult to make sure that you have it as correct as you can be and you still may miss something which i guess that's just par for the course but yeah. and that's the challenge of nonfiction because in yes fact, you can just make you can make it up even when you're basing something on on uh, romana clef you know you could still yeah you have a lot of wiggle room yeah, I, I keep saying fiction was a was a holiday <laughs> compared to this. Yeah. <laughs> Dean, do you ever write any fictional material? Because you seem to be really ensconced in this. I uh, do not. Uh, and uh, my background being journalism. And I, I fell into true crime a long time ago, 35 years before it was fashionable, I guess. I, yeah. it has been. Um, I uh, came from a history background. That's my interest in historical true crime. But I started my first job in journalism was covering the court beat. And I did that for a number of years. So I've covered contemporary crime. And, and that basically got me interested in putting my two interests together. I was, I was learning a lot about crime and justice and uh i had an interest in writing history and so i started writing about historic uh, cases uh, and uh because i'm a journalist who likes scoops the more obscure the better uh the better st the, the forgotten stories are the ones i really like and uh, mm -hmm. uh again yeah if, if 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 you're a journalist writing about history if you can score a scoop that's been around for 100 years and nobody caught you know that's a good, that's a good day at the office for a writer yeah yeah but no i've never i've never been tempted to write fiction i uh i teach something called creative nonfiction, and the creative mm -hmm. part is simply the storytelling yeah. how do you make the the most of the material you have without you don't but i'm very clear on the line you don't make anything up if you don't know the color of something you don't say what it is if you don't know what the weather was like which is very easy to find through the newspapers anyway mm -hmm. but you don't you don't make anything up you don't assume anything and uh, and I, I like working in that world. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I use my imagination constrained by the facts, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, with with his creative nonfiction, that sort of uh, it was pretty much Truman Capote's In Cold Blood that put that on the map, right? Right. right. Well, no, yeah. He, but he has been accused of maybe a little bit too much creation, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, well, but, but no. Uh, when you read In Cold Blood, I mean, you you see the. Uh, uh, the, the, I remember his uh, his description of Holcomb, Kansas. Uh, that just this vivid description of coming into this town, and uh, you know uh, uh, the, the the tattered storefronts, the the color of things, the, just just fantastic. And you know he was there. You know mm -hmm. he experienced that, and he's taking you with him. Yeah. Did you want to add anything to that, uh, to Priscilla? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the subject of this book being passion, obsession, and revenge. We have stories um, that are combinations of all three or focusing on specifically one, one of those. Um, what makes these themes so intriguing? I'll throw this to Priscilla first. Oh, passion, obsession, and revenge. Yeah. Why do we love it so much? <laughs> um, oh, because people are acting out things we would like to do sometimes, but we can't do them, uh, especially with revenge. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, am, I, I remember, oh gosh, and now I can't remember the name of the author, um, an author who writes for Texas Monthly uh, wrote about a woman who uh, took revenge on her cheating husband and she tracked him down to a hotel where he was with his mistress and when she came out, uh, he uh, when he came out, um, she ran him down with the car and then yes. for good measure backed up to make sure, <laughs> make sure. Yeah. And uh, when I read that story, it was written with such a light touch and it's not, <laughs> not funny, but, and yet it is. And, you know, uh, women are with her. <laughs> it's like Lorena Bobbitt is the poster girl of revenge. Yeah, I saw revenge. <laughs> You know, and then um, obsession is always that's the the horror film. That's the genre, uh, and then passion. Um, so my my story is really about a, a passionate relationship, uh, and what um, it's a it's a gay man, and and what he did when he was afraid he was losing his lover. Um, so uh, people can relate, and uh, uh, but but the things that you're writing about are extreme, and so uh, there's something entertaining about people who go too far, and you can shake your head and say, "Oh no, that's wrong," but you keep reading <laughs> and cheering them on sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Dean, what about you? What do you think about passion, obsession, and revenge? Why do we love it so much? I'm getting a little nervous here. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not <laughs> far away from us. Don't no, worry. the, um, uh, well, revenge, as, as Priscilla said, I mean, there's, there, it, uh, it almost inherently suggests there's been a wrong that's being righted, not uh, outside of the law, of course. But I, I suppose there's a certain, uh, a part of everyone who can who can uh, emphasize or, or relate to that idea of of uh, making things square again, mm -hmm. perhaps not hopefully not to this extreme. Um, well, you talk about a crime of passion. Uh, I think that my the case I talked about is uh, Belle Epoque Paris, 1914, and it's uh, the uh, the wife of a cabinet minister. Uh, in the French government, who uh, is uh, concerned that uh, the editor of Le Figaro uh, newspaper is about to expose some very personal um, things. Well, basically that they were having an affair before they married. He was still married to his first wife. Mm -hmm. And she is driven uh, by passion to the point where she buys a revolver. I mean, it's it's a case of premed it's, a pre it's totally premeditated murder. But it's used as a crime passionnel because she accesses a revolver, goes, confronts the editor at uh, his oh, office, yeah. and shoots him dead. Yeah, <laughs> so there's no, there's no, uh, there's no uh, shades of, of gray here. Uh, yet um, a court, uh, a jury uh, in a French court takes a different view of it. So uh, um, 
I, I don't know if any of us can really relate to the idea of being driven that much to uh, to seek revenge or to uh, to act out or uh, to act out uh, out of passion. But um, uh, I think probably a lot of the stories uh, that you'll read here will will be relatable in some way or. Uh, uh, even if it's only something we fantasized about. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, the, 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 the stories in the book are pretty much um, all over. I don't know if you've seen the book yet, if they, they've arrived, but yeah. uh, they're all over the place as far as uh, the subject matters, uh, the subject matter and, and the rationales behind the crimes. And, that, and that's what is some, some are pretty far out. I mean, uh, we've got a, a case from India where it was, um, a very horrible uh, individual who uh, terrorized people in a slum, and he he uses um, rape as his weapon, mm -hmm. and it's 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 horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous, and and this is uh, contemporary India. And uh, let's just say uh, the ladies uh, finally band together and seek their revenge on him when he's caught. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those one of those uh, cases that Dean will be sort of cringing over there. And <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm getting more comfortable with this. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll talk a bit about our individual stories. I'll, I'll sort of introduce mine a bit. Um, I wrote a story uh, called Facebook Mord which is set in uh it takes place in the netherlands uh, in the year 2012 um and it's it's quite a relevant story because um i don't know i don't think you two are as bad as me but i'm a, i'm really busy on social media i i'm you know i'm on facebook all the time i'm always hanging out at twitter i'm on instagram uh, but facebook's probably my number one place to go and this story uh Facebook Mord is translated to the Facebook murder. Uh, and it's about uh, some teenagers and they're having fun on Facebook and just doing what, you know, any teenagers do on Facebook. Um, but things get out of hand. Um, a, a young lady, uh, she's, I believe it was, she's, she was 15, uh, commented on a friend's post. And it, the, the comment was taken not very well by her friend, her, her best girlfriend. Um, and uh, things escalated and, and uh, threats were made and uh, it ended up being where uh, her best friend and the best friend's boyfriend decided to hire a hitman to kill this 15 year old girl because of a post she, a comment on Facebook. I think I remember that. Yeah, and uh, it's just one of those situations where, uh, you know, a lot of people are getting out of hand with, with because they can hide behind a computer screen or their phone, uh, and they are saying things, and 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 things can escalate. And it could have been anywhere. It didn't have to be on Facebook. It just happened to be on Facebook. So of course, Facebook kind of gets the big black spot on it yeah. <laughs> because it, it was there. But um, it, it's it's a it's a tragedy, really, because um, there were so many people who were aware of these things that were going on with threats being made. Um, even the uh, perpetrators' parents knew, and no one took it seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, this girl is stabbed to death. Oh my God! Mm. Yeah, yeah, mm. and. So it's it's a really relevant story, uh, and and it's kind of a cautionary tale as well because um, you know parents need to really see what their kids are up to, you know, mm -hmm. and perhaps if they had been more vigilant, this could have been stopped. But you know, so a promising life was cut short, and uh, as I said, it's quite a relevant story. Mm -hmm. uh, Dean, would you like to uh, discuss a bit more in depth of, on your fascinating story? Dean's our historical man about town here, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, uh, uh, the relevance of my uh, story, which goes back over 100 years, as I said, to uh, 1914 Paris, and uh, not to repeat what I said earlier, but uh, uh, it really does um, uh, hopefully recreate another time and place. And then this is a place where uh, the the perpetrator of the uh, the homicide, the uh, uh, Henriette uh, Caillot, uh, who's the uh, the wife of the cabinet minister, um, there's a lot of sympathy for her. I mean, she shoots down a, an editor in cold blood 
but there's a backlash. What was the editor, even though the editor didn't publish these compromising letters, the fact that he had them and may have wanted to publish them seemed to be enough, many minds, to to make her out as some kind of hero. And uh, we get a real sense of, uh, uh, of, a, of a strata of society in Paris at the time, uh, wealthy, aristocratic, where uh, in a sense it was almost as if she had fought a duel. You know, Mm -hmm. The victim, Gaston Calmet, uh, 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 had the misfortune of not being armed and didn't realize it was a duel. Uh, so it was very much murder, or should have been murder. But it, um, I'm just fascinated with stories like this that really lay bare what's really going on in society. You know, that, the, the role of privilege and the role of power. And... Uh, that ultimately uh, could, without giving too much of the spoiler alerts, but uh, you know, the question will be, will this allow someone to get away with murder? Mm. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, and that whole thing about uh, privilege and wealth and power and how people are not being uh, held to account because they have the means to get out of these things sure is, is very mm. relevant now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Priscilla, give us a brief rundown on, on your story. Yeah, uh, mine is, as I, as I said, I, I was doing research on um, George Bosque, who, George Manuel Bosque was a Brinks driver who uh, stole 1.85 million, kind of on a whim. Um, and uh, the connection I had to it, to the story, uh, was that um, after he stole the money, he disappeared from San Francisco uh, and w moved to New York. But he, of course, was on the lam, and the FBI was after him and police and everyone else, and they couldn't find him. And he had worked, before he worked at Brinks, he worked as a security guard for the San Francisco SPCA. And uh, he was there, I didn't know him, but he was there about a year or so before I uh, joined the organization. And I was working as a executive secretary to the president. So how the story came to me was I was uh, one day uh, shortly after the, um, the theft, um, I was sitting at the reception desk during the lunch hour covering it for the receptionist who uh, was out and I was all by myself when the mail came and a big envelope came addressed to my boss with no return address. I opened it up and I looked inside and there was nothing but hundred dollar bills and right away I thought oh this is this is George, <laughs> and it was. There was a note that said, um, this, please accept this humble donation on behalf of the animals. Uh, so that was my connection to the story. Um, and uh, I, I thought for a moment about helping myself because you know, there was all this money there. Uh, but then, of course, I did, and I gave it to my boss, and we called the FBI, and they came in and interviewed me and him, and they left with the money. I don't know whatever happened to it. Um, but but that got me interested. Years later, I thought, I wonder whatever happened to, to George. Uh, and so I started doing research on it and uh, got really absorbed in his story. And it's a, it, it's a sad um, story. It, it was the passion is that a lot of what he did was to try to save a relationship that he was in. Um, and uh, it, he, he seemed like uh, such a nice person who was just lost and just made a series of bad choices. Um, and he ended up going to prison, served his time, came out, um, and he died. Uh, I think it was an accidental overdose of uh, medication that he was using to treat epilepsy. Um, so I, I go over all that in, uh, in the story, in the anthology. Um, and uh, I, it, it, it satisfied my curiosity about uh, who, who was this person? Why did he do that? Uh, and and whatever whatever became of all this? 
Yeah, it's it's um, th the thing that bothered me the most about the story was that that money f that he sent to the SPCA ended up uh, they, the animals didn't get it. I mean, then you, at least they should have just left it, leave the donation for the animals. You know, well, and the and the irony to one of the ironies of it, and what made him um, take that particular uh, bag of money or two bags of money was that he was picking it up from the airport. It was what was called bad money they're used bills when bills get paper we don't use paper money so much but when bills get very crumpled the fed gathers them and they used to burn them and so this was all money that was just going to be burned and as he was collecting it, he thought well i could use it better than that so <laughs> just sort of on impulse took two bags and went off with it yeah, yeah, but just to, as a relevant fact for our for our viewers in the Miami area, George actually was from Miami, right? Yes, yes, he was. He uh, attended the military academy, and he was a good student. Um, and he he for a long time he wanted to get into police work, and he had epilepsy and a number of things. Um, kept him out uh, but yes he was a Cuban American uh, native of Miami okay uh, Dean back to you uh, on your story um, since because you mentioned earlier that you are very much focused uh, you just love historical uh, true crime uh, how do you think historical true crime is relevant in today's world you, you touched upon that a bit earlier but can you expand on that a bit well I think one thing it shows is that uh, human nature doesn't change very much. Um, <laughs> laws may yeah. change, uh, the new crimes may even come along. Uh, but uh, I, there's a certain comfort in that. It's disturbing as well, I suppose, to think. Uh, but it's, um, as I said, it's just such a great way to learn about the past and to learn not just how the justice system worked or the development of policing or, or advances in forensics, but uh, just to see how people lived what they thought was important and uh, uh, as expressed through the law. And um, as I said, uh, human nature, uh, the, uh, the fascination with crime, I think is, is, uh, is a real eye opener for, I think, a lot of people to realize that uh, uh, our current explosion of interest in true crime is nothing new. Uh, I saw a quote in my research and it was uh, the effect of, uh, uh, there's nothing that the uh, the average reader wants better than a gore to, to read about than a gory murder with the, with all the trimmings, and that's, <laughs> that's that could have been written today, you'd think, but yeah, it was written true. in the Chicago Tribune in 1880. Oh wow! So, uh, so uh, and then of course these are newspapers running verbatim transcripts of trials. So there was just such an appetite even then, and I uh, I think it's partly because. Uh, you know, it's not just a ghoulish thing. I mean, people are interested in what happens in the justice system because it affects mm -hmm. us all. And um, for justice to be done, as they say, it has to be seen to be done. And uh, um, mm -hmm. media attention, books on true crime, uh, people watching true crime is all part of that process of uh, society really coming to grips with what's happening. Yeah, I think we're just probably a bit more sophisticated about it now. I mean, in the past, I think they used to give out pamphlets in the street for uh, the trials and people would be like packed up to the rafters. This is entertainment. You know, there were no, there wasn't any television. There wasn't any motion pictures. So this was their form of free entertainment was to go to these these trials. And the, and the more ghoulish and the more horrible the crime, the more entertaining it was. And of course, to go to hangings and until uh, yes, uh, the right were abolished about mid 19th century uh in the introduction it was mentioned i have another book out about this dr crane the serial killer well he ultimately uh is executed and there were more than five thousand people thronging the streets outside the old bailey and newgate even though they couldn't see anything it was all behind the walls so that says something about the 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 appetite of, of some people for uh, uh, for the, the more ghoulish side of crime. Yes. Well, the, the same thing happened with Ted Bundy. Remember yes. when he was executed, there were cra hundreds and hundreds of people standing outside. I was just going to bring that up about them thronging the roadside as he yeah. was going to be executed yeah. as well. But but I mean, in, in Bundy's case too, at his trial, he had groupies there in, in oh, the yes. courtroom. 
Well, yeah, and you always have that phenomena too, which is harder to understand, I think. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, that whole serial killer thing is is that's that's a completely different phenomenon, and it, it's just bizarre how that. Um, I mean, but Bundy's like the poster poster boy for serial killers, and he just keeps going on and on and on. I think he'd be thrilled to death that he's thrilled to death. Yeah, that's a good choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> I think, it, you know, well, he'd be laughing in his grave if he is in a grave yeah, well, about how he is still so popular and so relevant and how there's just book after book and television series mm -hmm. after television series. And, and how many years ago is this now since he's been gone? Like 25, 30 years? Please, More yeah. maybe. Yeah. 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 Maybe 40 years, actually. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, did you have any questions you wanted to ask each other since we're all together? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask Dina, what newspaper did you start out with? It was a newspaper in Halifax, the capital of Nova Scotia, uh, the Chronicle Herald. Uh -huh. And uh, as I said, I uh, I didn't have a legal background, but I got one very quickly by being, <laughs> in, court, by being in court eight hours a day. And uh, I uh, just by chance was asked to do the court beat as fill in for a week. Uh -huh. And I was hooked. By the end of the week, I said, you're not going to take me off this major trial. And I ended up winning the job, basically. So uh, oh, you know. great. Yeah, editors have a way of doing that, just assigning you to whatever needs to be done rather than what you're yeah, prepared to do. Uh, That's I, funny went, I went no, reluctantly, sorry. but I, but it, uh, yeah, I was, I was really glad that, because it, it just, it just, uh, it was a, I mean, it was for a journalist. I mean, it was important. It was, it was hard news. It was important stuff, mm -hmm. and it, and you had to get it right. So oh, much yeah. writing on, yeah, it. and um, it just introduced me to a world I, I had never been in a courtroom before. I mean, I think most of us want to say that. Well, I was never in a courtroom before. <laughs> uh, either either by either by chance or or, or by uh, summons. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, I um, I just it was sink or swim, and I was able to uh, keep my head above water, and uh, and that, as I said, morphed into an interest in in uh, looking back in time at, at how the courts had dealt with things. Mm -hmm. I, I have to admire your perseverance to be able to do that. I, that. When I was in journalism school, that was the assignment I hated the most, was going to the courtroom and just, you know, doing a mock mock report on something. I was like, oh, God, I hate this so much. Uh -huh. Well, uh, well uh, Mitzi and Priscilla, I went on to write uh, a textbook in media law in Canada, actually. Oh, wow. I really oh, wow. enjoyed it. Oh, no. my God. Very yeah. cool. Oh, wow. That must have been great fun. Not. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it hasn't been made into a movie yet. No, <laughs> you're, waiting. you're waiting for Warner Brothers that contracts at the door. <laughs> get, get, who are we going to have star as the, the headliner in this one? <laughs> It'll be tough. <laughs> Uh, well, um, just to mention as well, um, I, Priscilla had mentioned since you're in this book, but you're going to be in an upcoming book, which um, uh, I don't, that's not even available yet for pre-order, but uh, both both of you are actually going to be in that. And uh, Dean is also in uh, the book that came out just before this one, um, the Well-Mannered Crooks, Rogues, and Criminals book. Mm -hmm. and, and another fascinating historical story that you wrote for that. And you, if you want, you can tell us about it. Well, it's about a con man named uh, uh, Joseph um, Wheel, who went by the the name the Yellow Kid, and uh, he's almost a pro. Well, he's he's a prototype for the kind of con man you see in the movie The Sting, yes. uh, a champion or a, a a master of the long con, uh, like an Ocean's Eleven type of con, mm -hmm. uh, elaborate build up uh, casts of uh, of uh, of other con men playing roles. Uh, he would commandeer banks and to, to dupe his victims, and uh, just uh, it's just a rollicking story, and uh, uh, made made less uh, made sort of lighter by the fact that most of the people he uh, he conned or swindled uh, should have known better. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, Mitzi, I'm starting to feel like a Mitzi groupie here. I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but you're so good to work with. 
<laughs> oh, I appreciate that. I, I, I keep keep the compliments coming. I, I, I love it. Just keep it. Just yeah. <laughs> oh no, well, I'm really. It's it's just so exciting to get people that I really love to work with in my books, and we have our our hostesses back. Oh, back. Oh. Your mic is off. I can't hear you. Thank you so much for okay. the conversation. It was wonderful to hear you guys speak. And it's funny you guys bring up Ted Bundy because I'm actually going to school at Florida State. So that is a very uh, hot topic here. That yes. Always comes up, always is coming up. But yeah, um, we're going to start doing the Q&A portion of the event now. And we have three questions. So um, the first question is, what do bookstores mean to you? And anyone can answer, so feel free. Oh, good. Well, I'll, I'll throw something in there. Bookstores, uh, they're sort of, they're, they're my church. <laughs> For, I, I mean, I'm probably since, I've, I've been a big reader since I first learned how to read. I'm, and I'm not exaggerating there. I really just started to read. And uh, I would just go and, uh, especially as I got into my uh, pre-teens, bookstores were the place to go where I'd hang around. And, and uh, we don't ever want to lose bookstores. Mm -hmm. You know, we may have ebooks and we may be able to buy stuff online, but we still need bookstores. This yeah. is the place that you can be a looky loo and discover treasures that you didn't know about. And yeah, this is something we don't ever want to lose. Yes, I, I absolutely, and especially your little bookstores, not the big chain so much, but we support those too. Um, like here in Atlanta, we have Karis Bookstore. Uh, which has been around for decades, uh, independent, um, and they carry a lot of uh, titles that other places wouldn't necessarily carry. Uh, and so, you know, we just have to keep supporting them. I fully agree. I, I'm in a, um, I live in a town called Wolfville in Nova Scotia, and we actually, bef just before the pandemic, um, just a, a family situation, someone uh, went out of business, uh, our, our indie bookstore, and we really feel mm -hmm. it here. There's a, a large number of writers, and, and for a writer, it's just, yeah, it's it's like what Missy said. It's like a, it's almost like a, a home away from home in a way. You you get to know the staff. They get to know you. They they right. just do such an incredible job of of promoting your book. Uh, you know, if if people come in and they're not sure uh, what you know, they talk about their need and they say, "Well, I'd like a local history." Well, maybe my book will pop up in the radar and and uh, and I think it's important as authors, I you know, to uh, support those bookstores and buy from yeah. them as well. And um, so uh, it really, and um, of course, they, they sponsor events. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, I, I had the experience of being in a bookstore, and I was just about to uh, you know say I'm I'm here. I'll, I'll sign some stock, and the woman ahead of me, and I I I, I saw she was uh, going to monopolize the uh, staff person first. I realized she was asking for my book. <laughs> oh, wow, that's so true. To say, well, yes, and if you'd like, I could sign it. <laughs> well, that is so cool. But you know, there's many things like that. But it's just that you uh, you just develop such great contacts, and 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 it really is so important as an author to to have to know you've got someone in your corner who's got your back and is is going to help you with it, on this journey to uh, promote your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That was awesome. Okay. So the next question is, how do you feel about true crime becoming so popular in television nowadays? Gosh, I, you know, it's amazing how much true crime there is on television. You, you Just when you think they, they've, they've covered everything and saturated the market, there's some more coming up. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure how I feel about it. I, I will say it makes it a lot more challenging to find cases that haven't already been covered somewhere. And then that pre that creates more burden on all, all of us who are writing these stories to find something new to say or at least frame it in a way that is different from how it was presented on television so it, it makes things a lot more challenging it's i guess it's just a different kind of storytelling i mean obviously it uh, it can uh, bring a story to life in a way that's that's much more challenging on the page but uh and i think it's just a reflection of um, 
uh, even though I said that there's always been interest in true crime, uh, you, you could argue that it's never been uh, as pervasive as it is now because we have so many different uh, mediums. And of course, beyond television, the, the whole internet world of, uh, of people gathering together to try to solve crimes and, and podcasts and, uh, and things. So uh, I suppose that, isn't, don't they say a rising tide floats all boats, I guess. So yeah. It, yeah, I think it does help. Uh, it helps us all, but I, I, I think it's because um, I think it's I really think it comes back to the storytelling. Yeah. You know, there are narratives that matter, and there are narratives that that hopefully have a, uh, uh, a not a Hollywood ending, but a, a an ending where there's some justice done mm -hmm. in some ways, and uh, and I, I think we all want to see that. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I don't really watch network television, but lately I have been hooked on Netflix documentaries about true crime. So I just finished watching uh, the Fire Festival uh, about the uh, the festival that wasn't and the con man who um, uh, initiated it and ended up in prison. Before that, I wrote the docu. I watched the documentary about the uh, school scandal uh, with par and I can't remember what it was called. With parents who were uh, essentially buying, bribing, getting bribing administrators to get their kids into Ivy League schools. So uh, I am pretty much hooked on true crime uh, on television. If you consider Netflix television, I guess it is. Well, I have to say, I got. Um, I, I try not to get any more true crimed out than I already am because I feel as if my whole life has become true crime. I'm driving in true crime. So I try to avoid it if it's on TV. But I did watch that Peacock one about uh, the uh, Epstein one and, and Gis Ghislaine Maxwell, is it? And yes. that riveted me. That was yeah. really well done for the yeah. three quarter. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And our last question is, is there a lot of research involved in writing true crime? Does it take nerves of steel or a certain personality to be able to hang out with these folks on the dark side? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe we're all rather dark individuals <laughs> to delve into this. I would say it takes a hell of a lot of research to do. Yes, that's that's the whole thing is 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 getting all this research done and then trying to craft it into a something that isn't going to be dry, but that's going to be a, a colorful piece of reading. You know, you don't want to have it's not a newspaper article and it's not a scholarly article. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, there's just, I'm not sure if we're getting in touch with our dark side or not. I just think it's a matter of uh, ferreting out these stories and presenting them and, and, and uh, perhaps educating people or, or making them aware of something that is something they need to be aware of. You know, it's, the, these stories all have something to learn. You, there's always something to learn from these stories. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. I don't really think we're perhaps uh, obsessed by the macabre or anything in particular. I think we're just obsessed by um, uh, the truth and and getting these this information out there and and doing it in a way that is engaging to the reader and and will perhaps enlighten them about something and make them think. Yeah, I, I was going to say too, I found I, in doing um, not uh, the George story, but the other story I wrote about was about a murder. And I found uh, I had a harder time with that because I didn't want to indulge in what Don Winslow, uh, the writer, calls um, the pornography of violence. You, yes. want, you have to let the reader know what happened and you have to let the reader know that he or she should be shocked at this and appalled, but you don't want to indulge in any kind of... Um, Prurience. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you don't, there's a line there to walk and sometimes it's hard to do. You, you want to give enough information so that the crime is real and horrifying, but not so much that there's any sort of um, pleasure or satisfaction somehow in reading about it. Um, so yeah, and research, as you say, it's a lot of it is research. 
Yeah, I mean, I try really careful that we're not sensationalizing anything right. or victimizing the victims anymore. And so yeah. that's sort of my job is to be the police person here, yeah. <laughs> Dean. And I, I feel that even in history, I mean, I'm dealing often with uh, cases 50, 100, 150 years ago. So there isn't the same, uh, uh, you know, sensitivities are gone. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, uh, you don't, you don't feel like you're re-victimizing. But, uh, but when I did my uh, serial killer, uh, bo my book on Dr. Cream, uh, sure, there has to be 10 murders in it because he committed 10 murders. But my focus was, how did he get away with it? So it became a detective story. And, and there's a, a parallel, I think, that can be satisfying as a writer between the detective work, the research you do, and the detective work that goes on to solve the crime or, or, uh, or bring, try to bring someone to justice in the story you're telling. And uh, so um, a colleague uh, of mine, uh, another uh, writer of History in Canada, Charlotte Gray, once described research as the fun part. And it is. <laughs> and you, can, you can happily stay in the research phase forever, much <laughs> to your chagrin, because it is. It, it's, it's like treasure hunts. And you, uh -huh. you know, the more you find out, the more possibilities you see. And, and even if there's a dead end, you don't find what you're looking for, you find five other things you can use in the book. So, uh, that's, so right. that, that's a very satisfying part. And of course, it's satisfying because ultimately, that's going to give the reader a, a richer, uh, more thorough and more accurate and hopefully more vivid sense of the story you're telling. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the good part about being able to write a full length book because you could just keep researching here. We've got to stay around. You know, I try to keep it under 8000 words. And that's like, well, if we do it anymore, I can't put anyone else in the book. You know, it's yeah. <laughs> only so much space. Yeah. Thank you all for those wonderful answers. So I think this is gonna be the closing of tonight's event. So thank you so much for joining us tonight and supporting indie bookstores. It's so important to do that in these times. And thank you guys, the authors, for the wonderful conversation. I'm sure everyone enjoyed listening. And I just wanted to remind everyone that you can order a copy of the book if you press this green button down below it sends you right to books and books's website so thank you guys so much i hope you guys thank enjoyed you. this yes thanks, thanks for hosting us yeah. thank you. Thank have you. a great night you too bye bye, bye.